Welcome everybody uh, to this uh, Biodiversity Genomics Academy session on Genome Scope. And I now hand over to Lucia and Camille. <laughs> All right. Okay, I guess I can start sharing screen and uh, introduce ourselves on the first few slides. Uh, are you seeing that? No. No? No. Try to go to the presenter mode and then share the presentation. Well, I can't because I'm only on one screen. Oh, you can. You just alt tap into it. And now we see it too. Cool. You see the presentation? presentation? We do, we do, we do, we do. All right. So welcome everybody. As Sujay just said, uh, we're going to start on the genome profiling workshop that we're organized for BGA 23. Um, and, uh -oh. okay. and we're going to start by introducing ourselves. And uh, so my name is Lucia, and um, I am a, a, a plant genomicist, a, a plant evolutionary biologist. Um, I've uh, worked for a few years now since uh, my MSc on non-model plant species, and I've always been interested in their evolution and their uh, genome plasticity and their genome divergences and their genome um, evolutionary um, processes. So um, I did my PhD at the Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh on begonia genome evolution. I was very interested in their diversity and their transposable element um, uh, dynamics. Um, I did uh, a lot of non-model genomics there. And uh, because of that, I got interested into KMERS because uh, all my genomes were very different and very weird. And I had to learn a lot before I did the assembly from them. So I got uh, a lot into actually, you know, working on the KMER spectra to figure out what was up with all those genomes. Um, then I did a postdoc uh, within the Darwin Tree of Life on, um, again, complex plant genomes. I worked on the mistletoe genome assembly, which uh, has been a huge milestone for the Darwin Tree of Life, as you could have already probably heard. Uh, I worked on the Scottish thistle uh, genome as well. Um, and I'm currently doing a postdoc on um, in Spain on uh, cotton genomics now. So now I'm, I kind of moved from non-model into model so I can actually do some genomic works after the assembly. And uh, I'm actually doing some pan genomics and some cotton uh, transposon evolution work. But I'm still a lot into non-model stuff and into weird genomes. And that's what uh, dragged me into working on cameras with Camille. Um, so Camille, you want to, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I, I actually meant to keep it a lot simpler than that. I, 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 <laughs> the thing is that the story is nearly the same, except replace complicated pan genomes by genomes that just do strange reproductive stuff. I studied asexuality and strange uh, elimination systems. And those genomes very frequently show wild ploides and wild genomic patterns and in the need of and truly understand those genomes we had a need to sort of uh, use these more advanced tools for looking at genomic data so this is also how we end up working with Luthia together on a workshop two, two years ago and uh, we cannot stop teaching this since <laughs> um yeah as how the workshop is going to go um we're I am going to start uh, on the first hour by basically giving you a broad introduction on what KMERS are and how to, how can we use KMERS to model our genomes and to get as much information as possible from them. Uh, we will I will do like a wee lecture for like, I don't know, maybe half an hour. I have no idea how long it will take, but around, you know, between 10, 25 and 35 minutes, I say. And then we can just split on breakout rooms and do an exercise that we've prepared for uh, for you on the GitHub with where we will run a genome scope many different times and many different genomes and we can start understanding 
um, how it works. Uh, and then I will hand over to Camille and he will, uh, he will start uh, uh, going a little bit farther on the genome scope model and explain to you how to uh, do genome scope like models in R and you can, you can play a little bit more with the models by yourself. Um, and then we will do a little bit of more on discussion and interpretation of, of weird genomes uh, data sets. Uh, we have the Discord channel where you can uh, ask us any questions, uh, but for, your, for all of you that are on, uh, on Zoom, feel free to raise your hands to, if you want to unmute yourself and just, uh, just ask a question, that's fine for me as well. Um, yeah, I think that's mostly it. We can, we can see how the time goes and then maybe have a five minute break in between your part and my part, Camille, if, that, if that's okay but depend on timing, I guess. All right, so um, why uh, are we into cameras? <laughs> um, basically, um, as most of you probably um, uh, are familiar and, and have done uh, during your research, some sort of genome sequencing. And at the beginning, uh, if you don't know much about your, your organism of interest or your genome of interest, you basically strat the DNA, you send it to a sequencing facility, and then you get a bunch of reads, right? Um, and if you're planning to do genome assembly yourself, you can start straight away if you want. Um, I would not recommend it, but you can always get an assembly out of it, right? You, it's a matter of putting it into a pipeline or a, or a software or something, and you will get something out of it. Um, how much that assembly represents the biology or your genome, that depends on many different things. So. What uh, cameras allow us to do is basically do some genome profiling before the assembly, before any biases that the assembly can introduce, and, and actually get to know what is inside that genome without relying on the assembly. Um, and I think that's very powerful. Um, what is a camer? Um, I don't know how familiar all of you are with camers, but the concept is fairly simple. It's basically a strand of DNA, a substring of, of DNA, uh, of, well, I mean, of anything uh, um, of length K. So K will, the K would determine the length of your, of your, of our uh, camer uh, that is contained within a biological sequence. So when we're, we're talking about chemists, we're just talking basically about the sequence of a determined length. Um, and this is, um, you can have chemists of a, any number between one and your whole sequence length if we're talking about reads. So you're not, you know, you can have short, uh, um, short reads like uh, Illumina reads, those will be between one and 150. Uh, but you can also, of course, we're working now with a lot of long read data, and that will pro definitely have a much larger ra uh, range. range. Um, but uh, so basically, you will increase the possibilities of combinations, right? Because we're working with two different, uh, four different uh, nucleotides, but you will keep increasing the, the complexity of these schemas the, the larger the K is. Uh, one thing to keep into account when we're talking about uh, chemists in genomics is that because you never know if you're sequencing one strand or the other of DNA, we're, we're taking into account what is called as canonical chemists, and this means that uh, we, because you never know if you're reading the forward or reverse strand, we're basically uh, storing the reverse complements as the same uh, sequence. Um, so it normally means that, for example, if you get a J, it, it will become an A, and if you get a, um, a T, it, sorry, it would, you get a T, a T, it will become an A, and if you get a G, it will become a Z. And then your canonical chemers will be always the reverse complement that go first in the alphabet. Um, oops, sorry. Um, the complexity of chemers uh, is very variable, as I just mentioned, depending on, on, um, on the length of K. And each of them has different applications on genomics. Um, you can probably, you normally use um, uh, different camer length for characterizing sequencing libraries, which it, it will go for like between 21 and 31 K. Uh, K. Um, you will use this for uh, genome profiling, which is what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, but uh, normally, if you use camers for assembling uh, genomes with the Bruin graphs, 
this will this game is tend to be a little bit longer so you get a little bit more of the of the um, integrity of the sequence for for your assembly um and if you're use and you can use much shorter cameras for something like characterizing assembled sequences all right so we've see we've assembled our genome sorry we're sequenced we've sequenced our genome we have a bunch of reads and we want to profile our genome let's say we got a bunch of uh, different reads and we want to split them into cameras to to get a camera data set that we can do the profiling with right The way it works, it's we start from the start of our read. We select our camera length. In this case, we're going to look at the K7. And then we will start taking the first seven nucleotides and then the one that goes from the second until the eighth and then from the third into the ninth, etc. So we will split it one by one. We will count that. We will then have a list of all the different camera sequences and then we will count how many times this is in our uh, data set. That is what we are going to call the coverage of the camer. Um, and so we will associate a specific uh, camer or a unique camer to a specific count or coverage. And then we're going to plot that. Sorry. Uh, and this is what, um, where our, uh, we're going to draw our camer histogram. And this is, uh, we're basically plotting the number of unique camers, the number of unique camers, sorry. Um, so basically how many um, camers of, uh, how many camers are, uh, unique camers are in a specific coverage. So how many camers are, are that are in one copy? How many camers are that are in two copies? How many camers are that are in X copies? We can expand the coverage as much as we want. So again, just taking account this this number, the count of each of each camer. And um, in our uh, hypothetical genomic sequence, we will have sequence, you know, a, a genome technically with two haplotypes. Let's start for that, right? And uh, you get a sequence, a bunch of sequencing reads that are technically also, you know, evenly distributed throughout your genome. So you will get the same representation of every sequence. Uh, and then you've split this into camers, right? You count these camers again, and you, you divide, divide, divide your reads into camers and you count them. So when you have this, this very even representation of, of everything twice in your genome, you will get basically what it's, what it's a normal distribution of all, of all these camers, right? That will, they will all more or less have a specific count because they will be in the same amount or in the same distribution in the genome and evenly distributed. So in here, we would sort of take that uh, our main camer peak is around 80 times or uh, in 80 copies, right? Um, but our norm normally our genome sequencing doesn't go like that. Like that. It has many other different uh, things that we have to take into consideration. And the first of, of them is sequencing errors, right? We all know that there is a small percentage and, you know, every year the technologies keep improving and we have less and less sequencing errors, but we have to take them into account. Um, and this will represent very unique changes in the sequence that will be in very low copy, but there will be a spread all around the genome, right? So you will get a bunch of camers that are in a unique copy or in very, in very low number. And this means you will get basically, if you plot them with, with the rest of them, you will get basically an asymptote next to the um, zero um, that, will, that will represent all your error camers. So the goal here is basically that your error camers are well separated from your main peaks. So you can't, you can't distinguish what is an error on your, on your modeling, on your genome model and what is not an error. But <laughs> our genome will also have repeats, right? Um, we all know that, that there's regions in the genome that will be in higher copy than others. And these will also, of course, have an effect on, um, on, on the distribution of, your, of our cameras. Um, and the consequences is that definitely when you have a huge satellite repeat or you have telomeres or centromeres, there will be uh, sequences that are in much higher copies that will be represented by cameras like this one. And in this case, what you will see in your spectra is actually a, he, a, a bump that can be, you know, bigger or, or, or smaller, depending on, on how repetitive your genome is. 
uh, towards the higher higher coverage on your on your spectrum. So this is more or less how how a chimera, chimera spectra looks like when it's well behaved and, and it's easy to model. Um, you can the, there's a, a few uh, aspects of the spectra that will change depend on the k, the choice of k. So um, when uh, when you use a higher k or, or a, a longer k mass, the more different unique ones there will be. So your peak is going to be taller. Um, the more different k-mers, the the less co the more different uh, unique k-mers, the less copies of each there will be because of course you're you're taking longer sequences and so you will have less of everything, um, and that uh, that means that your peak is gonna move towards the lower coverage side, and then the lower the number of k-mers in the distribution, also the narrower the peak will be. So you will also get something like this when you change k's, right? So. It will be taller and closer to the asymptote when the when the k is larger, and then as you keep decreasing the k, yeah, I'm saying it right, right, yeah, and then as you keep decreasing decreasing the k, then uh, the peak will move towards the higher coverage, and it will I will keep getting lower. All right, what else do we um, do we have on normally in genomes is uh, we well if we're <laughs> lucky we may be dealing with uh, haploid genomes maybe but technically we're, um, we're talking about different uh, different organisms that have different uh, ploidy levels as well right and at least uh, most of us we are diploid so we are gonna be talking about differences in two different uh, uh, alleles or haplotypes in our genome that will also be uh, seen in in this in our cameras right so we will there will be um uh, genomic differences or sequence differences between the two different haplotypes um and this heterozygous loci we're gonna also be able to see them uh, to uh, appreciate them in our spectra because of course they will be in a specific in a specific loci you will have half of your cameras uh, being um, representing one of the alleles and half of the other cameras representing the other the other allele, uh, and therefore the the count of those cameras is going to be half of the one in our main peak. So when you are representing a highly homozygous or a um, or a haploid uh, organism, you're only going to see one main peak because everything is represented once, and you don't have heterozygosity. However, when you have a heterozygous organism or a diploid organism that has some level of heterozygosity, normally you will see a second peak that is in between, uh, that it's half the coverage, sorry, of uh, your main peak. So in, it's, it's what you would call the monoploid peak or the one end peak. Um, and it represents those, those gamers that have half of the copies in one allele and half of the copies in the other allele. And therefore there's, you know, half of them of each. And they will be here. The taller the the monoploid peak, of course, the more heterozygous your genome is going to be. So it will represent the heterozygosity level of your genome. Um, there's a lot of stuff that Kamer spectra can tell us, and one of the things is, for example, genome size. This is something that you will see in much uh, deeper uh, with Camille. But I just want this. This is basically. Uh, you know, a quick way because we know the coverage of, of our cameras, we can sort of calculate or do a rough calculation of our genome size. This it's very important that we uh, have genome uh, flow cytometry data that can give us a hint of what the ballpark of our genome size is. But there is ways of calculating the genome size based on our camera spectra. All right, how do we actually count cameras? You can assume. You can expect we are not decomposing, causing our, our reads um, by ourselves and counting them by ourselves. There's softwares that do that. Um, there's many different of them out there. Um, I would uh, recommend something like KMC or FastK. Everything is moving toward FastK because it's much faster and efficient. Uh, KMC has been used for many different uh, uh, for for a long time, and and we've got uh, the tutorial based on KMC as well, uh, so it's also very reliable. Um, and then as soon as you have your camera spectrum or what it's called the camera histogram, which is basically 
your uh, coverage level and the number of unique cameras that is at every coverage. It's, it's a two column file that you will see in a bit. Uh, you can use start fitting models of, um, of genomes based on that. Um, this, this fitting models uh, step is what we're going to be focusing on in the exercise and it's what it's called genome profiling. Right, we're going to be using a tool <coughs> called GenomeScope, uh, but there's a few others out there like uh, Respect or Ter Tetmer that it's more focused on polyploid genomes. Um, and how does uh, GenomeScope work? <coughs> it's basically, so after uh, many different non-model organisms were sequenced and uh, a lot of it was, was yet to know on, on, the, on their heterozygosity levels and on their ploidy levels, etc. Uh, it, was, it became important to, to determine this genome characteristics bec before the assembly, right? So a uh, genome scope was developed to be able to uh, use this scammer profile to feed a genomic model into it uh, with um, specific genome size, heterozygosity, employee levels, and repeat content. So it, it will basically try to adjust your chemist spectra to a specific genome model and will tell you this, your chemist spectra adjusts to this confidence, to this genome model, uh, and this genome model has this level of heterozygosity, this genome size, and this repetitiveness. And you can you can play with that to be able to fit your data uh, as much or, uh, as you can to, to your model. All right. Um, this is also kind of essential. When not, sometimes when we're talking about biodiversity genomics, uh, a lot of us work on, you know, a, a great coverage, a really good quality, even long reads. But some of us um, are, are dealing with maybe short read data sets or, or uh, lower coverage um, uh, data sets. And this is an issue for, for getting uh, our genome, uh, sorry, our camera spectra to, to be, you know, uh, good enough for modeling. Um, ideally, what you want as your data sets for, for genome modeling will be high coverage data sets. So you will need to uh, your coverage to be enough to be able to separate those error cameras that we were talked about talked about that are towards the you know the lower coverage from your actual um, true cameras that are uh, that are in your genome. So you will be a, the model will need to be able to separate those cameras very well. And if you have something very close to the to the errors, like for example initial mistletoe data was way too lower coverage so it was it would just all merge towards the zero here uh, and with the with the errors but here for example i think this is a, one of my begonia data data sets um, again our coverage is too low and it's very heterozygous genome so the the monoploid peak will merge with their errors and this will cause problems with the with the modeling as well Ideally, you also want small error, error, error date uh, technologies and data sets. So um, this was designed for Illumina reads because they were the cheapest at the time. But of course, uh, any PacBio Hi-Fi or the newest technologies of Nanopore will, will also do good, good camera spectra. Um, uh, it's best not to combine technologies because they could contain different biases. And I, I've tried that before and it's a bit messy. But if you have enough coverage of any technology, I would recommend you try, but always keeping in mind that, for example, 10X will, can include some specific biases because of the type of sequencing as well as high C or any others. Um, and then I would recommend also any, any as bias free to your sequencing to be as bias free as possible. So maybe PCR free if possible, but you know, this is, this is not, not always uh, possible. Um, all right, so um, let's uh, get talking about genome scope and how it works. Um, if you're curious and you don't want to go into the uh, terminal uh, yet, and there is actually a browser, the uh, application that you can also use, and that is very, uh, very um, intuitive and straightforward. You can just drop your file there and then get it to run on, on, your, on your browser. Um, and something very helpful that I've always liked to look at is the examples on the, um, on the top uh, within the web page that it shows you also like a wide range of different genomes from, I think it has oyster, it has a hybrid uh, Arabis Arabidopsis, it has many different, uh, many different examples on how the, uh, how the camera spectra look like and, and how the model fits, fits them. Uh, but we are gonna be using the, the terminal version of course of, of GenomeScope and we will, I will be showing you how it works in a bit. Um, 
basically what you want to input to them is your histogram files that will be can be generated by KMC or Jellyfish or or FastK, and that will be look like this. This is um, uh, one of uh, one hist file that will just have one column that uh, has the coverage <clears throat> that goes from one to your um, uh, top um, selected threshold of coverage. Um, and then you will have at the, on the right the count of unique gamers that have any specific coverage. And of course, I mean, for with a hint, you can see that you have you have here the you know the error and sit asymptote going very high, and then it'll start decreasing the number um, until it goes up for your peak. Um, <clears throat> this is the output that you will get on GenomeScope, and how it, how it looks like. Uh, basically, you will um, you will get um, a plot with your your blue uh, histogram or your blue bars will be your own data and and uh, the representation of of the of the data set and then the the black line will represent the model that has been fit fitted into your your data set this i think this is the arabidopsis uh, hybrid arabidopsis genome i was talking about um and then you can see uh, the heterozygosity level and and the, the main peak and the one end peak and they, it shows also a log um, um, plot where you can see it's kind of zoomed out also the different peaks of the very high coverage that may represent sometimes the organelles or or, or high uh, repeats here this is the maximum of the of the coverage that we've picked as our the representative of our genome and uh, and it will also give you uh, a little bit of information on the model here and the parameters that is chosen and here it will tell you the heterozygosity levels the haploid length the repeat length unique length and the error rate uh, and it will give you a score of the model so it, it will basically tell you a little bit uh, and i think the genomes um yeah haploid and repeat length um will represent the genome size as well um all right so basically this is what we're we're planning to show to teach you how to do and how to uh you, you know use wisely uh, uh or as wisely as you can with your own data um this this morning um i we've prepared some data sets uh in the github page and a tutorial uh step by step on how to generate a camera spec drive if you're interested in running running kmc but I've also, you also have just a bunch of hist files ready to, to just run on genome scope uh, if you're curious. Uh, we've got um, a few plants, I think begonia and strawberry, uh, and then there's a frog data set, a stick insect, and a lichen that uh, it's also um, interesting to look at. And then we will be just divided into breakout rooms. Um, you can have a look at the GitHub uh, repository and go through the steps. Uh, ask us anything you may need and uh, we will be moving around breakout rooms and, and, and uh, answering questions. Um, yes, just to keep in mind, uh, just um, uh, try to feed your model right, right? So so you can, we, can, we will start by running, this will all be in the tutorial, but we will start by, start by running stuff by default, genome scope by default, but of course there will be some tweaking we can do to try to fit the model better, right? So sometimes your one end peak will not be um, uh, well fitted into the model and we will have to play with that. Sometimes we will be uh, finding polyploids that, um, that will not be detected and we will have to also play with that. Um, and of course, if you know more or less what the genome size should be, I mean, in this case, it probably won't, but it's always good to, to see how, when we change something on the model, how the, genomes, how the genome size is affected. And try to exp try to check that the model explains the data basically. Um, all right. So that is the yeah. best bit. So, best bit. Um, yeah. Sounds good. Can I show them? Uh, can you let me share the screen so I can show them the the tutorial? So we will now just split you in 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 breakout rooms and i have too many windows okay and basically all you need to do is just to 
go to the BGA genome scope uh, repository and just follow the tutorial. So beside the description and brother Christie's you hopefully have seen already, there is a small section that tells you about how to start the Gitpod link, uh, the Gitpod environment. We recommend you to do the, ex uh, the, the whole exercise within the Gitpod environment because we know that it works. Mm -hmm. uh, just one thing to be uh, aware of is not to uh, to start a new environment, not to use an, an environment used for a different session. If you click on this link, it should work <laughs> out of box. <laughs> um, the, the, pra the, the practical session will have two uh, parts. So there is like session one and uh, later on there is, where is? practical session two. So do just the first one. We will return and have a, like a bit of chat together before we jump in. And sometimes you will see that there are, that there are solutions here hidden in the arrow. So that is so you can explore on your own. And then once you feel that you run out of options, you would like to know what's the right answer, you will just click on it and it will tell you how you could have actually done it. Uh, it starts so easy, shows you how the, the command works, so you familiarize yourself and then it gets progressively harder. Um, we have, uh, yeah, in, uh, Suji just posted in the chat the, the link. So uh, I hope that's clear. We will meet here in 25-ish minutes. So I will I will just make you five breakout rooms and we will with Luthia just move between them and just uh, check with you on your problems. Perfect. So now I, I, I would like to show you how to do genome scope without genome scope. It's 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 not like too complicated and that is the reason why I would like you to you know feel empowered and. Um, there might be mistakes we might need to correct but i actually don't think so but uh, you know I, we will get back to that later um right. i would encourage you to if you especially if you have multi, multiple screens and are a good in multitasking to alongside this uh, presentation go through the tutorial because it, it, it's mirrored and and you you know the things i will be telling you about is something you can you can actually see within the within the exercise so this manual genome profiling is based on sort of like a decomposing of how the the, 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 the model of genome scope actually works. It's just that we have, a, we have a, a camera histogram, which is just a bunch of camera frequencies, right? And we will fit those frequencies by fitting the, the error peak and the four, four negative binomials, four peaks, so one, two, three, four and then make some form of interpretation of, of that fit, right? So they, for each of those peaks, I will know their size. And, and then, you know, the, the size of the first one is somehow related to heterozygosity and we can put a number on it. So how do we do that? So let's let's unpack it. So this is, this is a quite complicated scenario to start with. So let's just remove the errors. And as a matter of fact, I, the, the genome scope is not really fitting the, the error as a peak. What the genome scope does is that it's gradually masking slices of the gamma spectra and fitting the model without those gamers, just simply assuming that they do not exist. Sort of empirically trying of what's the best fit by just you know pretending that the, the error the errors will be like lower coverage than a certain threshold. And then what, what is what, what do you see in the model as this red line are residuals. These are the left-sided residuals of the of the, of the K-mer model. Okay, so genome score does not really explicitly model a like uh, errors, and we will do the same. We will just idealize a K-mer spectra and 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 just work with the two peaks. And you know the everything we will do on two peaks works quite similar on four peaks, but it just adds like one more layer of combinatorics, which it's actually not really important to understand the concept. And actually for 90% of genomes, if you would model the just the two first peaks, you will get almost exactly the same numbers as for when you fit the four peaks. So uh, so I think it's, it's it's actually fair enough to just aim for you to reconstruct this model that you see on the on the screen. So 
we're picking a distribution. We need to fit like fit a peak, right? So what distribution makes sense? Well, the sampling distribution, you know, from statistics that if you will sort of drawing the balls out of a bag with a certain probability, and what's the distribution of counts you, you get given the probability of drawing the ball of color would be a Poisson. This is called sampling distribution. But the problem with Poisson is that it's assuming that it's, you know, a fair, nice system where things behave. And sequencing, unfortunately, has a higher variation than Poisson. It's a so here he in you see in red the boss oh wait in, in in gray bars you see a Poisson distribution and and in in red you you see a negative binomial so we we the reason why we're actually switching from Poisson to negative binomial is that because we can add there this over dispersion parameter and this over dispersion parameter will just allow us to sort of extend the width of the distribution so basically we have a factor that we can put in just to say, well, this is this is that extra variation that, that we need to our Poisson distribution to explain the sequencing variation in coverage. Um, there's a reason, really good reason why to express the, the this variation parameter as lambda over uh, C, and I, but we will get to that in a second. So, the model will be fitting up uh, sort of a, some size of the of the first peak multiplied by the negative binomial. So negative binomial is a distribution, which means that whatever will be generated by the negative binomial will sum to one. And then we will have a beta plus beta uh, times a second negative binomial, which will also sum to one. So if alpha plus beta will equal to one, and we will condition it that way, then it means that this whole thing will together sum again to one, right? Um, note that the mean of the negative binomial we will be fitting will be the camera coverage. This will be one of the parameters that we will actually fit from the data. And then the, the, this, uh, uh, the over dispersion, we will also fit as a single parameter and we will, you know, the, the extra margin we need to explain the sequencing coverage variation will fit as the same parameter for the both peaks but we will scale it by the coverage, which means that, you know, higher coverage you will deal with, the wider distribution you expect anyway. And this is the way how to cover it without uh, fitting X insane number of, of, of parameters. Um, so this, this is close to working, but we still don't know what alpha and beta means. And there is also the problem that here it would be a probability like this whole thing would be one while we would actually like to fit a frequency uh yeah this is i wanted to be more explicit about the fact that every single probability distribution always needs to sum to one uh, but there is nothing else i want to say so the we're fitting frequency not probability so what do we need to do is to just multiply that whole thing by the genome length this is, this will be just the the haplet genome size that is represented by the first two genomic peaks. So that the alpha and beta are the relative contributions of one and two and peaks. Kamer coverage is the one and coverage, uh, and uh, and length will be the uh, the genome size. So why is just more or less? Well, because the 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 all the repetitive bits of the 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 distribution are really not covered in this model, right? We're modeling the sizes of these frequencies of these high complexity regions of the genome. We have no idea what's happening on the right, and and uh, and and we can, but we can fix that. We and because repetitions do represent a large portion of our genomes. So how do we do that? Is by starting something where what do we all know? So you know that if if you actually have sequence a three gig genome and you get 15 gigs of data, how many eggs you got, right? Am I saying something controversial? No, I, I don't think I am. So we, we can just flip this equation the other way around and get to an estimate. So we can just say the genome size is a sequencing yield divided by coverage, right? Um, and this exactly same logic you can apply on k -mas. So you need the, the sequencing k yield divided by Cambridge coverage 
And you know, the this genome size is completely ignoring the concept of ploidy. It's actually in the way wrong. You actually need to multiply the denominator also by the ploidy. And this will actually give you the, the haploid genome size. I should have written haploid genome size. Well, here it's intentionally unspecified. Here it's very clear. Um, right, so what is this sequencing K-mer yield? Well, it's basically just integral of this whole histogram. So basically what would you like to do is some all non-error K-mer coverages, just each K-mer that has, this is not an error K-mer, you would like to sum them up, just divide them by everything else. And because in the histogram, we're not keeping every single K-mer, right? We're just keeping how many k have a certain coverage. It will just end up being multiplying the K-mer coverages times the frequencies and summing them up. Of course, here, assuming that we already subtracted the errors out of these uh, vectors. Okay. I, I really played a lot with the, the idea of, of like manipulating these models in R and just, you know, handwriting it. And, uh, and I started to putting together a, a library of functions that are doing like a crazy ass genome models, uh, like uh, uh, fitting peaks that are not evenly spaced uh, because, you know, there is something weird with the genome or trying to fit the size of the sex chromosomes and this kind of thing. So if, if you if you would find it appealing and you would like to play more with with a, a you know, obscure way how to model genomes, you, you, can, you can just take a look on the genome telescope. I originally wanted you to also use the package and just like try to fit some wild models. But in the end, I decided that we will focus on like fully understanding genome scope instead. And I will just leave on you to pursue happiness in a form of uh, your own custom genome models only if you truly desire. Right, so you will be dealing with uh, stick insect game spectra. They are fun to deal with. Um, I will divide you again to your um, uh, breakout rooms. Please do discuss the problems with each other, and uh, and basically you can just continue through the tutorial. I hope that you were kind of already. The yeah, it's it's uh, it's fundamentally the same as fitting any any linear model yourself. I actually stupidly think I missed here a, a few slides on. Uh, I'm showing you syntax of the models, which I intended to do, which I apologize. And also the logic of the, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. That's, give me a second, give me a second. We have a question. Yeah, hi, Camille. So with genome scope, I think we are limited to ploidies around eight, right? Six. Six, okay. With genome telescope, can we play with higher ploidy genomes? No, 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 no. no, no. Same no. thing. So okay. the, 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 the limitation for ploidy levels is the combinatorics of, of how it works. Okay, um, let, let's actually cover this. I, I, I somehow missed uh, a few slides. Um, but it, it follows the same logic as what I was talking about before. So I hope that you will not even notice that I switch presentations. So we were talking about this alpha and beta and how it relates to the uh, to the heterozygosity, right? But we did not really cover how exactly that relates. And that is, so let's try to express alpha and beta in terms of heterozygosity. So let's have a parameter R that will be a probability of heterozygous nucleotide, important distinction. Nucleotide is not a K-mer. It's a nucleotide. It's a single base. And then we have a K as the size of the k -mer. So this is the only reason why we actually need the, 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 the K in the model. So if, if we have R as a probability of a nucleotide, the probability of nucleotide being homozygous is 1 minus R. Then if we would like to ask what's the probability of a whole k -mer being homozygous, we can just use that because these are independent events. And you can ask, is the first one uh, homozygous? Probability is n minus r. 
is the second one is n minus r, etc. So it will be just n minus r powered by k. Of course, it doesn't actually work the same if you would like to calculate the heterozygous because you need to cover all the scenarios of first nucleotide being heterozygous, second, first and second, first and, and, and third, etc. So a lot easier way around it is just to say one minus probability of homozygous is a probability of heterozygous nucleotide. But you actually have to think that this is a, just a probability and we're actually, again, fitting counts and each heterozygous side will generate two k minus not one. So you actually need to multiply it by a factor of two. So basically alpha is just this term and beta is this term. And it's as simple as that. So it's just uh, basic combinatorics that gives us the, the, the estimates of heterozygosity. Right, so the, the crucial part that I wanted to tell you and I forgot to add is how to actually generate those models in, in, in a, in R, I showed you the sort of like conceptually how it should look like, but I would like to show you how it, 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 it actually looks like. So we use this function L and LS. So it's it's the least square method, but it's nonlinear. The reason why it's nonlinear is because if you combine multiple negative binomials, it does not have a guaranteed optimal solution. The only solution that it can possibly find is by optimizers, like sort of trying something out and just empirically going through all the possible errors and, and you know, find a set of parameters that are have the smallest. So that's why it's still least square. So Y will be our frequencies and they will be explained by this alpha term times negative binomial with X, which are our uh, coverages. And uh, the parameters of the negative binomial will be the, the Kamer coverage divided by over dispersion, which will be the uh, over dispersion parameter, and mu, which is the mean, which is the Kamer coverage. I actually don't know why I flipped them around. I could have done it the other way. Um, and uh, then there is the second negative binomial, and it, the whole thing is multiplied by length. That's not all, because as I explained, it's nonlinear least square. So we need to give it a set of starting values. Actually, large proportion of genome scope is just about making guesses for all those things. But the thing is, you yourself can affect this. You, when you are fitting genome scope, you can give it a starting value for a camera coverage. You probably seen already. You you should have seen in in the few uh, camera spectra, uh, Luthia have given you that some of them did not naturally converge right that you had to just tell it that the starting value should be something else. Please search around this value. And it, it really does help, it changes a lot. The, and the last, you need to set up some uh, parameters for the, the iterator, for like how, how, the, how the optimization works. It's sort of like if you have this complicated landscape of parameters and the possible least square errors they have, how it actually permutates them. And, and that's it, that's it. If you if you basically copy paste this and have this uh, X and Y defined, it will fit you the model. Um, the way how it works is that it's, it will be estimating all the parameters that are not specified are listed in this list with starting conditions. Uh, and that's it, that's it. That's all you need to know. Oh yeah, and that's exactly 20 minutes. So let's try to... Uh, give you about 20 minutes to to work through this manual fitting of the model and let's then get back here together and go through some uh, go through both the the game spectra you should have been fitting yourself and then go through the uh, some insane cases that uh, uh, you know what you can possibly run into but you don't necessarily want to Great. Are we doing breakout rooms again? Now, could people uh, interact with us a bit more? Because I think that now, in basically, these last 15 minutes, we would like to use just to make sure that you understand everything right. Is there anything about these five histograms you would like to discuss? For instance, uh, you know, how comes that this toad has such a giant genome? Or I thought we were providing the right solution. Oh yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, now this is the right yeah. thing. 
So no, it's a... I, regarding the the liking, I didn't really. I I just said we probably have to remove one of the genomes. The lichen uh, is this the wolf lichen? Yeah. 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 yeah I, it's. Uh... This is a really interesting case. We are always talking about stoichiometries. We when we when we feed one to two, they're like the two gamer peaks. We always assume that they are in exactly one to two ratio. When you have a multiple genomes mm -hmm. at the different frequencies, they will not keep the same stoichiometry, and that can be actually a good giveaway away of whether you have actually sequenced one thing or not. And here yeah, you that's, have that's the whole point of the the begonia contamination one as well. I I, I added that oh, example. Yes. Yeah. So, so it, it is wolf lichen. The, the basic the conclusion is well, you should not fit such a model because these are not uh, stoichiometrically uh, well spaced peaks. The model will be always weird because you know you're messing together three different genomes. And uh, I think the, 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 the wolf lichen specifically here is a. Uh, uh, it is like a, one whole stalk of, of, of wolf lichen, and it just ended up being three haplo haplotypes. So this is just the fungal part of like it. Um, okay, if there are no questions rounding uh, like about the gamer histograms you were fitting, let's just switch to, okay, we don't want any of these. Switch to this. Can you see the slide? Yes. So <laughs> welcome to the freak show. The, uh, I would like to, get back a bit to the, the genome size. I don't know if all of you have managed to get all the way down in the manual genome fitting, but there was this section that explained of how you can actually get in the bottom of the genome size. And uh, well, yeah. And the way how I learned about importance of repetitive elements was on this crayfish. It's a, one of the quite well-studied organisms cytologically. So we knew it's triplet, and we also knew that it, the genome size is about 3.5 gigs. And uh, Uh, would you would you want it to discord for a moment? No. Um, and then when when we fitted a model, so this is like a triploid gamma spectra. You see, you see, it's noisy, but it's it's fitable. We, we are missing like a huge chunk of the genome, and the the reason why we found out is so you know, it's not very simple. It's a bit simple. So you know the genome. Genome size is estimated in genome scope by you know summing the gamma coverage divided by ploidy and haploid coverage. So what could possibly go wrong, huh? The, the ploidy is right for sure. The haploid coverage is also right for sure. So the only reason why, why it could go wrong is because the camera, the sum of camera coverages is somehow off. And uh, the problem was that the jellyfish stops, or even the KMC stops counting at ten thousand by default. And there were a bunch of cameras that were that had like millions of coverage and there was those are biologically real sequences so th th there are a few cameras that are occurring in seven million copies in the genome this one exact sequence is on seven million distinct positions within the genome and this is all biologically real so if you don't take those into account of course that you will underestimate the genome size but the beautiful bit is that if you actually do the proper camera counting and do calculate all the cameras, or if you use the cheeky strategy of fast of just summing them up together in the last bin, you will you can actually estimate the genome size right. So you see that this, you, all we had to do was just to remove that, uh, like, to make the threshold on the right so much higher to actually calculate all these super repetitive cameras. And we were just investigated and yeah, there was an expansion of these not quite recently in the crayfish genome. So it actually does make sense that they do have a, a lots of uh, very similar copies. And uh, you, you have fitted the Bombina data, right? You, you have fitted the right histogram because we gave you the correct one. If we would give you the default one, you will end up with the the with the, the histogram left. Can you spot the difference? You see, in, in, in toad genome, you'd miss five gigs. That's more than the, 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 the complex part. And you know, from, from the histogram perspective, it looks exactly the same, you know, because you're always looking at the high complexity part, but the, the, the fit will be very different. Okay, ploidies. Sometimes it's clear, you know, you you remember that 
The Sahara Mises fit you did looked a bit weird on its own. When you did the right fit, it looked a lot better. But sometimes you just won't get a satisfying answer. Me and Ruben Novel, we have spent weeks staring at these two plots. Well, actually, because this is a, this is a rotifer Adonis Ariki or Risi, and uh, it it if you look at the Kama spectra, it looks as like one peak, another peak, another peak, and another peak. What is this? So. You know, it could either be deployed, and this is the haploid thing, and this is something else. But the, you remember all the discussions about how things should be stoichiometrically in in agreement only if they come from the same source. Well, these peaks are exactly spaces they should be. This looks like half of this peak, and this small peak over here is exactly half of the one before. It's embarrassing of how you know stoichiometrically stoichiometrically precise these peaks are. But the thing is, we actually have karyotypes of this species, and it's 12 chromosomes. It cannot be octoploid. If it was octoploid, it could not be haploid or diploid, because it would just have the wrong number of chromosomes. It is not count of eight. So it could be that it's perhaps an octoploid on one chromosome and a tetraploid on a different chromosome. Like nobody knows. Like we this is this story doesn't have a satisfying answer, but I just wanted to show you that sometimes the chemist picture does show like a Really strange signals. <laughs> um, contamination can take a very different forms. It can be by the cobions. There is this famous uh, tardigrade gate where they, they uh, sequence tardigrade and said that you know they they have thirty percent alien genes or like an insane number, and uh, they they don't they they really don't it just se sequence all the bacteria that lives on tardigrade and. This is how the chemistry structure looks like. It's just, if you sequence tons of different things, you will have just a whole range of coverages and they will be, those peaks will be overlaid over each other and, and in very different coverage means. So you will end up with this kind of uninterpretable chemistry spectra. So if you can see something like this, don't just assemble and assume for the best. This is a big red flag. It doesn't mean that you cannot do anything with this genome, but you need to carefully curate the data. You need to think about how to separate the individual contaminants. And uh, there is a very nice paper uh, about this uh, correction of this tardigrade gate about like how you can actually make something out of it. But it just, again, genome scope is to, here to flag your problem, not to solve it for you. Yeah. Now that's, that's, uh, that, that's uh, Luthias. Turn. This is the last case. Now we have tons of them. <laughs> ah, it's true, I forgot, yeah. Right, now I just, uh, um, it was another case of uh, camera spectra flagging an, an issue, basically. I, I, during my thesis, I sequenced the uh, begonia species that was on the greenhouses of the botanics. Um, and uh, I, I did a few different uh, tissue collections and extractions, and then I pulled that to, to, to do Illumina sequencing. And when I plotted the the um, the a camera histogram, and I, I could see definitely two peaks, but they were as 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 Camille has been stressing out, they were not one was not half of the other in coverage. They were not stochastically. Sto no, was that stoichiometry? Sorry, stoichiometry. Stoichio stoichi it's, like it's, it's like chemistry. When it's you a very word, to, it's a very difficult word to to use in this in this context. One is not half of the other. They are not proportional <laughs> to each other. <laughs> and um, and that flagged uh, uh, an issue. Um, and then I kept, I, I basically, I, I kept thinking, you know, that there's some cobions of, on, on, the, on plants, you know, and then it could be a fungi from the soil or it could be some bacteria, but uh, it wouldn't definitely not be as much coverage as it represents because this is small, these genomes are very small. Um, uh so i went back to the plant and then i realized there's actually two individuals in the same pot uh same label same pot but uh what i thought because i had harvested the, the tissue in two different seasons the leaves looked different but i thought it was just a seasonal change but actually it was actually it was two different plants but two different genomes um, so I realized um, I, I did the, get some plastid reads out and I realized there were just two different things in there. 
and I just had to basically separate those two different things using block tools uh, based on coverage um, and then because they were two different plants as well so I couldn't separate based on on taxonomy or anything else it was just it was just uh, coverage based um, and then I, I just I could just keep keep one of the peaks and work from that on the assembly Thank you for sharing. That sounds like a traumatic story. My mistakes. <laughs> so, I would like to show some uh, honeybee data I've seen a while ago. They, there is this uh, paper a while back about how how uh, asexual bees are expected to reproduce, like lose a bit of heterozygosity every single generation, just because when you start a bit heterozygous, they will just merge some of the meiotic products and they will always have these small bees where they will actually lose the heterozygosity by the end of the, the, the telomeres. You know, the, the telomeric bit of the, their genome should be always uh, homozygous. And this, this is like a weird mutation that happened in the Cape honeybee in, in the South Africa. And uh, they, 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 they track the same lineage of asexual workers for already 20 years. So they are just sort of like a parasitic workers within the, 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 the uh, bee colony. And they, they have these three different lineages and they've made this whole story about how they are super different and how it's like interesting. These are, these are the, 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 the chromosomes and these are the three lineages, A, B, and C. And I was like, mm, that's really interesting how different patterns they're showing. The, the bee looks really different, right? And then I, they, they, I just, uh, because I was interested in paternogenetic genomes, I just plotted the, 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 the came the histograms of the lineage A and C. Well, actually plotted all three, but the A and C looked really sane. So I don't know if you know much about honeybee genomes, but that's they are expected to have 238 megabases. So you see how, maybe it's, not, it, 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 it's just insanely close. The genome size estimate is super close to what you would expect. You see that they're actually fairly heterozygous. So the story was about how the honeybees are not losing heterozygosity over time as much as we would expect. And they they as they, they thought it's because the, the recombination was reduced. And you know, looking at lineage A and C, I kind of believe it. But then they had this whole bit about how the lineages are super different. But look how the, the lineage B looks like. So first of all, you see that the pigs are not well separated. But moreover, if you just fit their model, even if this is just a problem of coverage, the you fit so much smaller genome size. There's just a huge chunk of the genome that is missing in the sequencing library. I didn't know what went wrong if it was, you know, slow freezing or three uh, uh, freezing and thawing cycle because of the AT rich genome. It just messed up with the DNA in a certain regions. I, I don't know what exactly went wrong, but I'm telling you, this is not a complete honeybee genome. There's no way how this creature is alive, like truly. And uh, and you, you can say, well, why does it matter that this number is, but you know, cameras do not lie. And even if, you, if, if, we, if we go like a completely stupid on, on the whole thing, and you, we would just uh, calculate the number of bases that map under each position within a genome, and then just go by dividing the sequencing yield by the sequencing coverage to make like a sort of a maximum possible estimate of the, of the genome size, we would get still, 40 max below what we would expect in a honeybee. So this is just, even if you go like really stupid and do something a lot less sophisticated and thing that less accurate, you still should see the problem. And you know, this was completely not acknowledged in the manuscript. If you get this kind of sequencing data, how can you pro ignore that? It's a, it's just a, I, that's why I find it so important that we just look at these plots. We don't really have to spend years thinking about them. You don't have to do what I did, but, uh, but just, just glance at it. Does it make sense? Does it not? And that's actually the last example I have, which is good because we have exactly 1201. So un does anybody have any closing questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, we are aware the genome curation uh, by hand, uh, hand curation, I don't know how, uh, rapid curation, I think the rapid curation workshop is starting just now. So um yeah it's uh, maybe some people have to move into that one um but yeah, yeah. If, if anything you can find us Sorry, we didn't have much time for questions but there's the discord channel for us the, to communicate and we're, we will be happy to 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 do that i hope that you had as much fun as we had
Bye. Thank you. A lot. Cheerio.